and broken dikes have made the Canadian sector in Holland a great flooded area. Activity is limited to guarding territory already held and to minor patrol activity. With treacherous mud underlying the water and main bridges blown by retreating Germans, movement of armor is at a standstill. Barges are pressed into service to supply troops holding the south bank of the Moss River. Jerry cans full of drinking water are brought up to waterlogged troops of the garrison facing the enemy on Crevacour Island. Stiff fighting under the most trying conditions has finally driven the enemy from his last strong points on the island and from the south bank of the river. As they keep supplies rolling in, our boats are under constant mortar fire from the north bank. One of our newest amphibious vehicles, the Weasel, follows the path of what was once a main highway. Road signs and traffic lights give way to buoys and floating markers. Roadblocks are easily disposed of as weasels play their part in keeping supply routes open. With nature and enemy demolitions combating our efforts, supplying frontline troops taxes the ingenuity of everyone. If a freeze-up occurs, boats will give place to sleighs as the operations again become a war of movement. In Holland, armored divisional signals carry on the RCCS tradition, the message must get through. A forward tank commander finds his wireless sender has ceased to function. He immediately dispatches a message for a replacement from a nearby tank back to advance brigade headquarters. At Advance Brigade, the message is received and taken to the signals office where it is registered for retransmission to the addressee. The signal master has several alternative methods of passing the message. Traffic is divided equally among the various systems to speed transmission. Fuller phone is used to flash it on its way. other methods fail, the dispatch rider gets through. So the message finally reaches its destination, technical maintenance section of signal clock. Here an instrument mechanic loads a new wireless set into his mobile service shop. It is rushed forward to replace the dud set in the tank. Through the work of Royal Canadian Signals, the complex organization of a great army is closely knitted together. Living up to the traditions of their patron saint Hermes, the winged messenger, signals are the fighting example of the motto on their core crest, Wellox, Versutus, Vigila. Speed, accuracy, watchfulness. Major General Spry, on an inspection tour of his command, visits a field artillery regiment in Holland. An informal checkup is given to one of the many units that make up the terrific concentration of firepower which drove the enemy back from the beaches of Normandy to his own border. In the wet, muddy gun positions, gunners must work overtime to keep their pieces in good condition. General Spry finds nothing wrong with the maintenance. There's no time for a regular inspection parade, so the commander has an informal talk with his men. Questions are answered and complaints heard. Jerry will hear more from Canadian guns when the advance again gets underway. In Antwerp Harbor is found the answer to the German claim of having blown up the main locks by means of underwater troops. In a steady stream, the great supply ships steam up the Skelt into the harbor. They are loaded to the gunnels with motor transport, tanks, and vehicle stores. Longshoremen labor day and night at one of the world's greatest ports. They keep the supplies moving up to the armies on the western front. The front door to our supply routes is indeed wide open. On the Wall River west of Nijmegen, the Royal Canadian Signals call on the engineers to aid them on a ticklish job. To maintain communications, a submarine cable is laid across the river. 
With a fast current flowing and only a converted barge from which to operate, the procedure calls for great skill. Staying out the heavy cable from the improvised cable layer, the job is completed on the first try. The cable will be used by signals as a trunk route to carry a large volume of telephone and telegraph traffic between two high formations. The Army Jeep has finally become streamlined. No more will the cold winds of winter freeze the luckless rider in the fresh air taxi. Something new has been added. A plastiglass superstructure guaranteed to make the Jeep as comfortable as a town car. All we need now are soft cushions and we'll have a real jalopy to drive after the war. A German-type flamethrower captured from the enemy receives a workout in Holland. Deadly indeed are the fiery weapons of war. Used by the Germans in the Blitzkrieg of 1940, they were adopted by the Allied armies with devastating results in our Blitzkrieg of 1944. Canadian-designed flame dischargers proved their work in the drive through Holland. In the offense, covered by smoke, flame-throwing carriers burn the enemy from his strong point. The Sherlock twins from Simcoe, Ontario, Flight Lieutenants Allen and Eric, are the cause of many headaches at RCAF Bomber Command. They just can't be told apart. Both holding the DFC and both having completed their second tour of bombing operations in Halifaxes, they have operated as a team since childhood. Starting business life in the grocery trade, one wholesaling, one retailing, they both joined the infantry and together transferred to the Air Force. First class pilots, they are popular with their messmates of the Lion Squadron. A Canadian Wren joins her sisters in the WRNS as a member of a Royal Navy crew. At a south coast port, the girls man their own craft. Many of the little ships have been taken over by girls. Their job is to ferry personnel from the quayside to the ships at anchorage. A popular lot with their passengers, the seagoing lasses handle their jobs like old salt. of the floating taxi, life sails smoothly by. The boat's crew consider themselves the luckiest girls in the service. A happy life on the ocean wave brings color to cheeks which need no powder nor rouge. Stoker Molly of Montreal is the only Canadian attached to a British boat's crew. Oh, oh for the life of a sailor. In Italy, it's holiday time for the boys of a Canadian artillery unit. The first event is known as the Skunk Hollow Handicap. The paramutuals do a land office business as the bang tails parade to the post. The odds-on favorite is Herbie, out of trouble. It's post time and the track is fast. The only problem is getting the blue bloods of Muldum to the starting line. The track master does have his troubles. It's a snappy six furlongs, and the favorite is the winner. A turkey shoot is another feature of the day. All the spectators are invited to enter the contest. The infantrymen think they have the edge, but the boys of artillery and signals give them a good run for their money. After winning the prize, you've got to catch it, and that's some job. To the victors go the spoils. There are going to be some happy faces around a certain cookhouse tonight. <laughs> <laughs>